Thank you, Tito. Hello, everyone. Now, is that too, is that too close? Um, so I get the accolade of being the last speaker. That's mine, right? Um, how is everyone? You, you all look quite, actually, from this angle, you all look quite awake and quite with it still. Okay, I was beginning to worry. All right, I had no need to worry. Um, thank you for the um, opportunity to talk to you today about the people part of the people processes and tools triumvirate, if you like, people, teams, and collaboration. Um, I'm excited to be here today because at last I'm on the agenda. Um, at last, I don't mean today, I don't mean last, I don't mind being last, but I mean at last we're talking about people. For almost 30 years that I've been in IT running programs and projects and stuff, um, it seems to me that we've talked a lot about the technology. Um, it seems that when we're not talking about technology, we've talked about methodology. And yet, as we all know, as we've all said, as some people have said explicitly, Johnny said right at that. Has Johnny gone? Oh, thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for that. I didn't want any dropouts for the last uh, for the last moment. If it was you, I was going to come and find you. Um, uh, anyway, where was I? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we, we know that it's the people. Johnny said right at the beginning, when the slides didn't come out, I think, um, uh, whenever he goes in to recover a program, it's the people that isn't working, the relationships that aren't working. Um, the key thing I took away from Johnny's presentation about PDM was the DQR process, right, which he referred to as the nice oval, I imagine it in a lovely mahogany um, board table with the business people sitting on one side and the technical people sitting on the other, right? But unless they're collaborating, unless they're working as a team, you're really not going to get anywhere with that. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I should, um, I should stop babbling and introduce myself. My name is John Turley. I work for Adaptivist. First question is, what's with orange? I thought this was just it's about the fourth orange slide that um, we've seen anyway. Um, Ad Adaptivist is, is really irrelevant, so nothing about those. For almost years of my almost 30 year career I've been a project and program manager I've worked for Infosys Consulting and IBM so providing services into customers and when I got the opportunity I went to work um, on the customer side for UBS and then for Thomas Cook so I've sort of seen large programs from both sides of the fence and it looks different I can tell you that mm. Got, I think that's a bit dull, right? The more interesting bit is that in 2017, I sort of gave up, right? I, I wasn't having any more of it. I thought, well, if 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 the powers that be, the really very senior people running the organizations in which these programs exist aren't interested in doing things differently and change the way we operate, if they're willing to tolerate so much failure, then and not look at new ways of doing things, even when we have demonstrated that they're successful and scale. I'm not interested. I'm out of this. I'm going to retrain as a plumber. That was my little euphemism for something else. But when I started to think about what I'd been doing, I realized that there were lots of questions about what I'd been doing that I couldn't answer. Why did what I did work in some cases and not in others? Why couldn't I bring the senior executives along with me? So I embarked on a two-year journey of learning. Really, I wanted to answer those questions that um, that I hadn't, that, that I couldn't, and this led me into a journey uh, into a world rather of complexity science and um, psychology and sociology. And I learned a great deal. I learned uh, about knowledge that already exists outside of IT that provides a framework which I could take my experience and that which I knew through intuition and put it in this framework. So I'm going to talk about lots of things that many of you will know. Right? You might agree, you might disagree. I, I don't seek to speak the truth. It's okay to disagree. But by putting things in a framework of knowledge, we start to be able to do something different with the way we run programs. And that, that it's those two things that I sort of bring and offer um, today. So through the course of the next, to be determined amount of time, um, supposed to be about another 35 minutes, I've scheduled for, but I'm going to give you a choice, I think, halfway through. We're going to answer those questions, right? Um, that's going to be the choice, yeah. Um, 
Uh, why, why are we interested in an agile mindset? Because if I put your hand up, you're thinking agile, what's that got to do with me? That's a methodology for developing software. Anybody? Oh, brilliant. Great. Um, why are we interested in an agile mindset? Well, the answer is because it's the source of collaboration, right? If, if, you, if you have a team of people that you're expecting to collaborate because that's what you've written down in your methodology, then they're not really collaborating. They're not generating any extra value. They're merely cooperating. And at the point at which the instructions run out, they kind of don't know what to do, right? Uh, what is mindset? Well, we could call it a psychology. That's what the psychologists like to call it. We could call it um, our way of making sense of the world around us. I like to think it really is the underlying assumptions that I've made through my existence as I've worked out the story, my narrative to my experience, that, that guide my actions, really, that I'm not even aware of. So it's a set of assumptions or a way of making sense of the world. How do you change it? Well, that is a journey of personal growth. And that journey, each of us individually has to choose to go on or not. We don't have to, obviously. But as leaders of organizations, be that teams or departments or programs or entire um, hospitals, entire companies, we can create environments in which people are more likely to choose to take a path of personal growth. And there are great benefits in doing so. Oh, I always forget that one, sorry. It's not just about um, collaboration, however. If you, want is some, if you want something disruptive, if you want a disruptive way of doing new things, you need to innovate. And then that mindset, collabor a collaborative mindset, agile mindset, is also at the heart of being innovative. Um, so why is it important? Well, it's to do with complexity. Now, these aren't my ideas, okay? Um, you might have come across these ideas in various other places, but uh, as a result of globalization and technology and scale and the fact that organizations like the NHS need to use um, suppliers, for example, things are getting more complex. What do we mean by complex? Well, quite simply, we mean work. a complex environment is an environment in which we have lots of moving parts, and those moving parts are high. That means that we have a non-linear relationship between cause and effect, which we're not familiar with at all. That doesn't really matter, right? Forget about that. But it does some crazy things in a complex environment. Complex environments tend to be more volatile. They tend to be more ambiguous and more unpredictable than, let's call them at the moment, non-complex environments. And that's something that we struggle to deal with. But that's all somewhat academic. To understand complexity better, I was going to talk about some analogies. Those analogies there, I was going to make analogies about river and highway and rainforest, um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to talk about the environments in which, until the last couple of years, I've been working in, which I think, as I've listened to everybody talking through the day, are very similar to the environments that you guys find yourself working in. So I mentioned I work for Thomas Cook. Once upon a time, about 10 years before I finished, Thomas Cook had an IT department, and the IT department did everything that the IT department needed to do. Okay? And then they outsourced some of their core capability. They outsourced it because it was getting harder to run, needed new skills all the time, and they needed to cut costs. Now, at the point at which core capability gets outsourced, things get more complex. So now the person in IT can't stroll across the IT department and talk to somebody they've maybe had a long, uh, a long time relationship with. Maybe they live on the same street. Certainly they work for the same company, so they have similar, um, a similar understanding of the business and have the best interests of the business at heart. Now they've got to talk to somebody in the outsourcing company in IBM maybe. And that person in IBM might have Thomas Cook's best interests at heart, at best, but they've also got IBM's interests at heart. And I don't mean that those two things conflict necessarily, I'm not being that rude, um, but I do mean that that individual in IBM, you am sure they want the best thing to some degree for Thomas Cook, but they've also probably got other customers and they've got objectives that are set by IBM, not by Thomas Cook, right? So there's some sort of misalignment at the very least. But also the relationship has changed, hasn't it? that relationship for the person in IT and Thomas Cook is no longer um, uh, governed by sort of social norms. It's no longer a social relationship. It's become a commercial relationship. 
And that commercial relationship is governed by contracts, service catalogs, SLAs, change requests, all that kind of good stuff that's necessary in some environments. But again, you've got more moving parts and those moving parts are, are highly interconnected. So it gets volatile and so on. But of course they didn't just outsource to one provider, they outsourced to three different providers. And those three different providers all looked after technology, past ten, all looked after technology that was highly dependent upon each other, but of course they didn't talk to each other because they didn't have commercial relationships with each other. So now that person in IT has got to navigate three sets of contracts and service catalogs and change. And they've got to uh, uh, get the information flowing between providers so that you can coordinate what's going on technically in your change programs. That's a complex and that is not hardly mattered, did it? It works better in uh, in Keynote, but anyway, there we go. Um, that's not, however, either an artic a sort of a complete articulation of how the world works, nor has it always been true. So I'm not for a minute saying that the world is getting more complex in some sort of uh, homogenous, uniform way. It isn't. Much of the world remains what a, a term Dave Snowden seems to have popularized for anybody that's familiar with Mr. Snowden. It's a complicated world. OK, and the idea of a complicated world really is that the relationship between cause and effect is linear. OK, so a jet engine might be complicated, but you know everything that's going on in it and how those things interact with each other. And this view of a world being complicated means that it's, well, first of all, everything in it is either known or can be known, unlike the complex world where there are unknowns and unknown unknowns, which really creates problems for predicting and planning. Um, it's, it's deeply ingrained in our way of thinking, in a Western way of thinking, okay? So we could, we're not going to, so don't worry, we could go back to Plato and a chap called Heraclitus, the ancient Greeks, we could go back to Newton and we could talk about his view of the world, right? As you all know better than me, probably, um, he thought that if you knew the mass and the force applied, you could predict anything. He said he, you could predict anything in the universe if you knew those two things. Right? That's a stable, predictable universe. Now, his thinking ingrained its way in our culture. You can see that in uh, Adam Smith in 1773, he writes The Wealth of Nations and his visit to the pin factory and all that. That's a production line, right? That's a simple relationship between cause and effect. You can see it again in Alfred Sloan's study for General Motors in 1921, which hysterically, I think, probably not, um, produced um, a hierarchy diagram that, that if, if, I, if I had a slide with it on, it would look really familiar to you, a hierarchy diagram, a hospital or any big organization. This was 100 years ago, okay? And of course, we see this idea in Frederick Taylor's scientific management, right? That the world is relatively stable and it's relatively predictable so we can plan. We can see that in the way we're on on projects. We want to run projects, sorry task lists, how long do they take, what order do we do them in. There's some room for the unknown in this view of the world, right? We call it a risk log, but it's very limited, isn't it? Because it assumes that we can write our risks down. So there's not an endless list of risks, there's a limited number. I've run programs where we could just spend all day writing risks, right? And it assumes too that the risks are relatively unambiguous because we can write a simple description of them and then we can plan our response to them. Well, some of the programs I've been on, been involved with, risks aren't. Even if you can identify them, they're, they're ambiguous, right? They're hard to describe. And we'd spend hours doing it. What a waste of time. So this brings a challenge to our way of thinking, okay? And as Einstein said, you can't solve the... What did he say? It's on the board, right? You've got to have a new way of thinking to solve the problems that were created by the old way of thinking. This is where mindset comes in. So what I've tried to do in a little bit more time than I was supposed to take is explain to you why an agile mindset is important because it's at the heart of operating in a different way. It's at the heart of collaborating better. Why do we want to collaborate better? Because that's only a partial answer, right? The reason we need to collaborate better is because more of us are working in complex environments than we were and we often don't recognize it so we keep thinking and we keep acting in a way that's suited to a, um, a, a complicated world a stable world am 
Am I talking too fast? No. <laughs> I always think if I'm getting a bit out of breath, I must be talking too fast. What's an, what, what's it, what is an agile mindset? Well, at the beginning of the 1980s, well, in fact, still, the, 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 the most common view of what a mindset is comes from cognitive psychology, right? Bloody hell, I'm saying this to a bunch of people from the NHS. This could be risky. Okay, great. Any neuropsycho? Anyway, anyway. Okay. So, um, round about the 1980s, the common view, and I think it's still the case, it definitely is still the case, is, the, is sort of a cognitive view of psychology. So, in the cognitivist view of psychology, the brain's an organic computer. It gets its input from the five senses, right? If, if it's working properly, it takes the input from the five senses and it produces a fairly predictable, consistent outcome. Okay, sounds crazy when you say it out loud. So it sounds crazy to me, right? But if you've ever explained something to somebody and then they haven't appeared to have grasped whatever you've told them, so because you're patient and you're nice, you think, well, I must have explained it badly, so you do it again and again and again and again. And after five times, let's say, if you're a very patient person, you're thinking to yourself, well, it can't now be the words I'm using because I've tried every different way and I've whiteboarded it in the whole nine yards. This, this person still isn't getting it. That's you're operating. When you do that, and who hasn't, you're operating from the point of view of um, uh, cognitive psychology. You're thinking, well, there's, there's a malfunction in this dude's brain, right? Because I've explained it clearly. So, there's, there's, so that's cognitive psychology. But because the brain stops developing around the same time as, uh, same time as our bodies stop developing, the cognitives cognitivists also think the psychological development stops at the same time okay so by your early 20s you're a fixed type if i were to ask people who type of person that's comfortable with risk who is the type of person who would say they're not comfortable with risk which is fine we're not all right and who's somewhere in between learning to get a bit better with risk maybe i suspect everybody would have an answer i should have asked i suspect everybody would have an answer um and nobody, when I've asked that question previously, has ever said, hang on, I just reject the whole idea of me being a particular type. That's a paradigm I'm engaging with, John. What do you mean? Right? Nobody does that. Everybody comes with the idea that we're a type of person. I'm the type of person who's comfortable with risk. I've been told it many times and made a reasonable career out of it. However, there is an alternative way of viewing the world, I mean. So uh, an alternative to the cognitivist view is the constructivist view. The constructivist view is, you're all looking for the change, aren't you? Yeah, do, if per, first person to spot a change when I press the button, raise their hand. Um, so the, um, the, the, the uh, constructivists have got a different view. All that cognitive stuff is going on, but we're also all doing something else. We're making sense of our reality all the time. And this sense-making capability is our psychology, is our mindset. And the more sophisticated our sense-making capability, the more complex our sense-making capability, the better we're able to handle complex environments. Okay? So, um, I was going to give you an example, but I suddenly can't think of it. Oh, yeah. So, imagine that you've been on a, a, a project or a program that's failed. You're going to have a think about that experience because you want to get better, right? You want to learn. And imagine that what you decide, I think this is quite feasible, is that the problem with that piece of work is that we didn't plan it well enough. So too many things went wrong. There were too many risks that we hadn't spotted. We should have planned better. Okay? The next time you start a similar project, what are you going to do? You're going to put more effort into planning better. Okay? Fine. However, if you get to the end of a failed project and you say, um, uh, I think we planned as best we could. The problem was that we just didn't have the information available to us. What we were doing was too new. It had never been done before. And given that most people in here seem to agree that data migration organizations like hospitals or NHS trusts is a one-off activity, there's a whole lot of learning that's got to be done, right? So maybe you might think to yourself, I think at planning in that sort of traditional waterfall sense, maybe that was, maybe we were just trying to do like that was the wrong approach. Right? Maybe it can't be done. If that's the conclusion that you come to, then you're not going to pour more effort into planning next time. You're going to pour less effort into it. Okay? So what I'm trying to illustrate is how the narrative that we create to explain our history has a big impact on the way we behave. Okay? So 
The scorpion, no, the lobster's supposed to go black, right? So briefly, the developmental psychologists can help us not just understand how this works, what the mechanisms are, they can help us understand that, um, this is the bit that I'm ter I think I might forget, they can help us understand that um, we all move through discernible stages. Now don't get me wrong, we don't actually move through discernible stages, but it's a useful framework to help us understand, okay? And there are five stages, and there are multiple frameworks available, I've seen anyway, but they all seem to have uh, five stages, but they have different names for those stages, okay? Most of us have made it to stage three by the time we're beyond our adolescence, so let's say in our early 20s, okay? Now, um, the vast majority of people are either stage three or stage four. A hero of mine is a developmental psychologist called Robert Keegan, and he calls those stages co-authored and self-authored, right? And I'm not gonna try and explain what they are. But for us, we could think of a co-authored and a self-authored mindset as being maybe an operational mindset, a mindset that is used to, that is expecting stability and predictability, a mindset that wants to plan. Now, on occasion, I've worked with project and program managers. That it's ever so difficult. Once you've noticed somebody's got their eyes shut, it's ever so difficult not to um, not to keep looking at them. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, they were. So it's very rude of me. I apologize. Um, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah, an operational mindset. So an operational mindset expects things to be fairly stable so they can uh, predict what's going to happen and they can plan. Now, on occasion, I have worked, a slack handful of occasions, though, I've worked with project managers who are so uncomfortable when those um, assumptions prove not to be true, they, they kind of freak out. They get so uncomfortable that they can't plan and execute a task list that you have to say, you're really brilliant but you just need to be in another role just for now. And you've got to get somebody who can deal with the fact that the chaos is breaking out, right? And they're, and they're different people. Anyway, so operationally, people with an operational mindset seem to struggle with that lack of stability. Stage five is a transforming mindset, okay? Almost no people have a, a self-transforming mindset. That's what we could call an agile mindset, okay? Less than 1%, according to various studies, but one by Keegan, of people have a fully stage five mindset. But um, seven or eight percent, according to which study you look at, um, are on their way to getting a stage five mindset. OK, and there are some key things that you can do essentially around the way you view the world and the way you're learning about the world around you that changes. So how long have I been talking? About 25 minutes. OK, and I'm, in that case, I'm going to I'm not going to ask you the question. I'm just not going to do this. Um, so what we have here is, this was the extra detail you were going to get, right? But you're now not really going to get it. Or maybe you are. Um, five stages, okay? Across the top, we have what could be seen as objects and what one is subject to. That's interesting. We've got this underlying structure of meaning making, right? What you can see here, really, I mean, I don't understand what Keegan's diagrams here mean, particularly. But what you can see is that things definitely get more complex, right? They're about as simple as you can get here. This is when you're two to six years old, right? I don't know what across categories mean, but I can understand systemic and I can understand system of systems, right? So they're getting more complex is, is, is the point I'm making there. This idea of subject and object is at the heart of Keegan's subject object theory, which you can look up and read about yourselves if you're that interested. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you about it. However, what I will tell you briefly is that uh, these are both, this is uh, information from two studies, and essentially what we've got here is the stage three socialized or co-authored mind, stage four, stage five, and from two studies done on these number of people here, one by William Torbert and one by Bob Keegan, you can see that the number of people that are in stage three, between three and four, or in stage four is pretty high, right? The number of people in stage five isn't. Now, it doesn't really matter what stage you're in, to be honest. It's kind of irrelevant, but a more sophisticated mindset would help because, of course, with a more sophisticated mindset, you can do all the things that you used to be able to do pre previously, but um, you've got some other sort of tricks up your sleeve as well. So what does an agile mindset help you do? Well, it helps you do that, right? This, this is a guy with an agile mindset, okay? He can see the bullets coming. First of all, he can see the bullets coming slower, right? 
that's really important. A baseball player will tell you that, or a cricketer. You've got to see the ball come in slowly. You've got to recognize your reality more effectively. And of course, he's very agile, right? So you've, when I said you've got a few tricks up your sleeve, Neo's got a few tricks up his sleeve. How am I doing for time, Tito? I forgot what time I started. Is it? No, oh, I've got to slow down. Oh, no, this is the good bit. I can slow down. So how do we develop an agile mindset? All of that stuff is just about me framing what the problem is, right? Why do we want an agile mindset? And then what is it? Because in, in certainly in the bit of IT that I work in, we talk about agile a lot. There's an agile community, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Johnny uh, mentioned it earlier on. He said the way he was explaining PDM looked a bit waterfall, but actually it was agile. And indeed it was, because the arrows between the boxes, they had arrowheads on both ends, right? Now, I don't know PDM very well, but I did get my Prince 2 accreditation once. So I know something about methodology, right? And, I'm a, and a PMP. Um, and the problem with the boxes, with the arrows that point in both directions, I found, and PDM might be different, is that well, when are you supposed to move? In which direction? How are you supposed to know? We've got to make that decision for yourself, right? I think that can't be written down in methodology. So I've tried to articulate what an agile mindset is and how it helps us become more agile, what we mean by that. People in the deliberately developmental environment to solve is a problem that they can solve. You know they can solve. It's not a good candidate for a DDE. Go and do it. Go and solve that because that's what the business needs. But those really thorny, ugly, horrible problems like how do you get people to uh, work together um, on a DQR board or whatever it's called? Sorry, Johnny, should have read the book better. Um, can't remember what it's saying. Oh, no. <laughs> Joe. Yeah, go for it, Johnny. Yep. Yep. No, I, I would agree with that. They do, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yep. Right, you've lost you've lost me, Johnny. I don't know. Did he? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> me neither. Yeah. Oh, good. Correct. Yeah, it did. No, it won't. It won't. It won't. It won't mirror the reality. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, of course you do. I mean, this is a this is a long and complicated conversation, right? And you didn't say any. There was one thing that I that I maybe thought that I disagreed with, but basically, I totally agree with you. I did say at the beginning, this comp, these aren't my ideas, right? We can go back to Plato and we can go back to Heraclitus. We could look at Buddhism and Taoism. Um, ab absolutely has a lot in common with this in a more Eastern way of thinking. You're absolutely right that stage five mindset looks like Maslow's self-actualization when we are, and you're, you're absolutely right that the idea of the world being either complicated or complex doesn't really work. That breaks down when you start to examine it. However, at the moment, I think we're in a position where most people don't even understand that there's a difference or how to recognize one from the other or know how to let go of some of their assumptions about how to operate in the complicated world. So I agree with you, Johnny. Yeah, no, we're definitely in agreement. Um, it's got a very sophisticated mindset, clearly. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, clearly has. So look, that, that's a, a bit about a DDE, right? Well, we're just trying to put the, the learning back in the flow of real work. Um, but we need to make that a little bit more for people. Um, there are a number of things that we need to have in a, uh, well, actually we call them action learning groups, but in it, let's just call it a group. That group could be any group um, to get them to begin to uh, storm right after the forming, which is kind of something Johnny talked about, um, but in a, with a different curve, right? Um, you, the group has to be working on a complex problem. So if one person can understand the problem, and the solution it's not complex enough you need to have a problem where multiple people need to come together each with their own partial perspective manage to communicate those partial perspectives and together come up with an understanding of what the problem is that's a complex problem if you can generate that if you if, the, if they work on that and Johnny said that it's great to form a team if they're working on problems agreed if they're working on complex problems even better but that's not enough on its own. The complex problem needs to be um, salient to their day-to-day -day work or, or, or the data migration projects. But it doesn't just, just need to be salient, it needs to be meaningful. They've actually got to care, right? If they care and it's salient and it's complex, probably the fourth and I think most important ingredient is that you, you have to get people out of their comfort zone, okay? The psychologists, the ones I've read anyway, like to call it disequilibriating. You gotta get people off balance a little bit, and that's actually a little bit uncomfortable for people. This is why it's a journey that they've gotta to choose to take, right? And you don't wanna push them so far out of their comfort zone for so long with so little support that they have a nervous breakdown. Obviously, that's very bad. And that happens, right? I've seen that happen on programs. People have to go because they couldn't keep, the, keep, keep going with the pressure. So you want them just outside their comfort zone, but just far enough with the right support, able to come back when they want to. So they're really forced, if they want to sustain that position, to think about their ideas of what reality are, right? And then if the crisis is significant enough, and, it, and crisis is maybe too big a word, but it's one I use a lot, then they're likely to go through some sort of mindset shift and move more to a position like Johnny was just articulating. Johnny and I had a conversation with Tito the other day about how we're relatively comfortable with ambiguity, for instance, and a lot of people aren't, particularly when people are younger, they're not comfortable with ambiguity, right? We learn to be comfortable with ambiguity because if you forgive me, gentlemen, we're old lags, right? We're old fellas. Could we do something so that people could become comfortable with ambiguity like we are without having to go through the same crisis, because I used to hate ambiguity, right? And, and not, it not taking quite so long, because then our people would become more capable quicker without paying such a personally high price. So 
within Adaptivist, we use a couple of um, techniques uh, or tools to help us understand and unlock all of this. One is that because we recognize that some areas of our organization are more complex than others, and we recognize that in complex environments, we need lateral interactions. Those lateral interactions, if you look at all of them across an organization, form social networks. And those social networks are actually the way real work gets done on your program. It's, it's, not, it's not because so-and-so reports to so-and-so, it's because so-and-so is prepared to go and work with so-and-so and they'll collaborate to unlock problems, right? That's a social relationship. And if you can map those across an organization, you can learn a lot. If you can map those in your organization before you start your data migration project, you can start to understand some really interesting things. You can start to understand who are my key collaborators, because you can see them in the mapping, right? And the key collaborators, rather than the technically best people, maybe they're better people to have on your DQR board or on your, um, um, on your um, steering group, right? Once those collaborators are identified, and we, we identified a couple in our organization. There were a couple of people who were bridging more silos in our organization naturally, not because anybody asked them to. So we went to them and said, can you do a bit more of that, essentially? And they, they liked the fact that we'd recognized it and we valued it. And they started to do more of it. And that's been a powerful catalyst for change. We are also doing some coaching called Immunity to Change, which again is based on Robert Keegan's work. It doesn't really matter what stage you are right what matters is where's the sort of developmental edge how sophisticated are you in your thinking and can you become a bit more sophisticated and keegan's immunity to change approach which is very simple helps people unlock the um, hidden assumptions they don't recognize that often operate in conflict to their stated goals and stop them achieving things and those changes in their mindset change how they behave very very quickly and those changes in how they behave, they kind of ripple out of the organization. So you start to create a lot more, a more agile organization quite quickly. And that, that's been a powerful and amazing thing. The third thing is that we create a counterculture. The counterculture is the DDE. There's a counterculture that we're building at the heart of our business that says you can come in here and you can play. We call it a community of practice. You can come in outside your from your day job and you can form an action learning group to tackle complex problems. And when you're in that group, expect, however, to be challenged and expect to challenge us. Expect to learn, to question the way you're thinking and the way you're doing things. And what we're unlocking there is really, really powerful change. Just in the way, ah, anyway, amazing stuff ha happening. Those, and that's how we form teams. So that, so what I'm getting at here is that creating a counterculture you can do around a board table with your DQR board and your um, uh, the other one I can never remember the, the name of. Right? You can get people in a room and you can say, listen. Um, well, no, we won't go into that. But you, you, around the complex problems, you can start to get people forming into teams by creating a counterculture. Oh, so once you have an agile mindset, you can do things differently, right? You can act in a way that's more congruent with a complex world. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Here are some of my beautiful colleagues. That, uh, that come, I've never been as proud to work for a company as I am uh, for Adaptivist. Some of my colleagues. Uh, that's me done. <laughs>